Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's after lunch, but really, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> you are in Watch the Hacker Hack, a DrupalCon presentation. If you don't think you're in the right place, you should probably leave now. <laughs> so, the three of us up here, I am Michael Hess. I am MLH407 on Twitter and MLHess on Drupal.org. This is out of order. Oh, no, it's not. Ben Jevons, Coltrane on Drupal.org. Uh, and Greg Kanadison, Greggles on Twitter and Drupal.org. And I work for the University of Michigan. These two guys work for Card.com, who happens to be hiring, and they're awesome to work with. <laughs> so, who's secure? Raise your hand. <laughs> really? No one? <laughs> oh, one person. Okay. Who has a site on the internet? <laughs> Who's secure? <laughs> so, problem is that your site on the site on the internet probably isn't secure. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. It is a target for people to attack. In fact, it's probably being attacked. How many people think they've ever been attacked in their life? How many people think they haven't been? So not all the hands are up on the first time, but on the second time, <laughs> there seems to be a little problem here. <laughs> so the only way to really make sure that you are secure is to remove yourself from the internet. And even then, you're not really secure, like unless you're going to like solder closed all your USB ports and all sorts of other things. But now that you've been given this great advice by three great people, how many people just disabled wireless? <laughs> or, you know, powered off their servers? When we talk about security breaches, we often like think about bid sites, right? So a lot of bid sites are in the news when they're broken into. So this is a graphic of um, breaches by, I think, a user accounts or, or records lost in those data breaches. Um, these are the ones that we hear about in the news, Target or Sony or uh, Panama Papers or you know, these sort of bid companies, bid groups. Um, but it actually also happens to small companies. Uh, Verizon did a research study uh, in their data breaches report, and 70% of data breaches were organizations under 100 people. Uh, so it's happening to large companies. It's happening to small companies. Um, it's happening to everybody. There was a survey, I don't remember where where I'm citing this from, and maybe I'm making it up, but it was something like 70% of businesses reported security breaches or security attempts against them, which would imply that 30% didn't have them, and really the 30% just didn't know. So why would you be a target? Greg, why would people be a target? <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, speaking as card.com, we have a lot of information about our customers. Um, like we have financial information, numbers. yeah, uh, their debit card numbers. So that's, you know, certainly an obvious target um, is an organization that has that kind of sensitive information. Um, but I think, you know, with uh, the um, SQL injection issue that we saw with Drupal a year and a half ago, um, that, uh, you know, a large number of sites got attacked. And so every site that's connected to the internet is, you know, some sort of a resource that can be used for attacking other sites or to harvest information out of it. Um, so whether you think your site is a target or not, the answer is that it is a target. The only question is how easy will it be to get into the site? So in the case of the SQL injection issue, um, that was fairly easy to break into a lot of sites all at once. And so that made every site a worthwhile target, right? There's a, a trade-off between the level of effort to get in and the, the value of the resources inside. And eventually, at some level of effort, every site becomes a target. Everybody know what we're talking about with the SQL injection issue? <laughs> So we've heard a lot of things about this, like no one cares about my small site. And I store medical records, but not people's names. Seriously, this was in an email. So no one would <laughs> attack me. Or I'm in some industry and no one really cares about our data. And all of these are false, as Greg indicated. If you're on the internet, you are being attacked. Look at your Apache logs. You'll see people attacking you. How many people work for a hosting company in this room? <laughs> How many people have seen attacks on sites in their logs from a hosting company or from not from a hosting company? How many people have ever looked at their logs? <laughs> Who has never looked at their logs? 
Okay, we're gonna wait 30 seconds. <laughs> Seriously, we're gonna wait 30 seconds for you to go look at your logs. So we also need to be aware that it's not just Drupal that's at risk. Like we, this is a DrupalCon, we talk about Drupal a lot, but there's other things that are running that are attackable. So how many people run a web server? It's kind of hard to run Drupal without a web server. How many people like know if that web server is vulnerable? What about MySQL or Postgres or some other database? Linux itself, Memcache, Redis, Solar. Hey, anybody update Image Magic this week? <laughs> like Image, how many people? Image Magic is a library that deals with resizing of images. It's not the default library used in Drupal, but it had a pretty serious vulnerability that is actively being ex, uh, exploited, where you could basically run code on the server. So if I can run code on a server, what can I do, Greg <laughs> or Ben? Uh, whatever, whatever the web server can do. Right? So, so like anything, databases? yeah, access the database. Web server is going to be talking to the database. It's going to be uploading files, maybe to the private file system. So somebody who can upload an image with this malicious uh, payload in it could access all of those files. Um, I think the the most interesting exploit that I saw related to Image Magic was opening a reverse shell so that somebody could get an interactive control to that server um, and run just arbitrary commands um, from their own server. So they can, you know probe it and get us a, a nice tight feedback loop um, to be able to probe the server and execute additional things. So as this is a DrupalCon, we're going to focus mostly, almost entirely on Drupal. Uh, so let's actually get started. <laughs> what? What? What is this? Um, I'm running a Mac here. I don't know how I've got a Windows error message. We'll, we'll take questions afterwards. Yeah. This is my work. What do, you, what do you mean it's your work? I mean, this is, this is my work. You, you hacked my presentation? <laughs> yeah, I did. What? And why would you hack my presentation? Uh, why not? But like, <laughs> what do you have to gain by hacking my presentation, disturbing all these wonderful people? <laughs> well, we have eyeballs. I mean, publicity. Publicity <laughs> for what? Volunteer. <laughs> Why Palantir? Uh, because I'm going to work for them. Oh, so like and you, you guys should too. So you should just take a look at our logo for for the uh, five minutes that I have here. Uh, I've captured your attention. So you hacked my presentation for the purpose of putting a logo on my slides. I mean, the attention is on us, right? <laughs> How many people have been hacked and like someone else put like links to like spam or Viagra or anything of that nature? Yeah. Similar here, so okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> can, can we continue? <laughs> Are we allowed to continue? Yeah, you have my permission. <laughs> so we're all hackers. Like this term, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like, this term is get, gets misused a lot. Anybody coming to sprint days at the end of the week, you're all hacking. You're hacking on core. In some cases, you might actually hack on core. <laughs> but that's okay in that instance. When we're talking about hacking here, we're referring to the traditional or the non-traditional, depending on what, where you stand, of someone who is attempting to break into a system in which they should not have access to. And we have to talk a little bit about the types of hackers. So people do this for different reasons. Um, there are people out there who actually hack for good, and that's kind of what happened today. The, the presentations we're about to show were people hacking for good. Uh, you have people who just run shell scripts and just don't really know what they're doing, so like SAO5 was mostly exploited by this. You downloaded a script, you ran it, you gave it a URL, and it gave you an account on the site. You didn't have to understand how it worked. You didn't really have to have a good set of skills or understanding of what SQL even was. You just knew that if you ran this Python script and handed a URL, you could log in as admin. Uh, there are different colors of hats, which I'm not going to get into, but people hack for different reasons, and we kind of like assign colors to them, but it seems that you know the only ones that are agreed on are black and white. And there's like other colors in there. Uh, we have like, unfortunately, these state-sponsored hackers, people who are paid to hack sometimes by a government, sometimes by corporations, the FBI, CIA. <laughs> We have people like Michelle who hack for personal gain. Uh, they want, you know, they have monetary interest to be gained by hacking. And then there's some other groups that fall into other. 
Thank you. <laughs> so we happen to have this new site that was put up recently. And this is the site that was given to our hackers to attack. And it was a clone of an actual real site. And we thought we followed best practices when we built it. So it has things like two-factor authentication. Speaking of which, if you're not running two-factor authentication on your site, that's another thing we should stop, wait the 30 seconds for you to download the module and install it. Uh, someone on this stage up here wrote that module for Drupal. I'm looking at them. <laughs> and you, check it out. Uh, it's a multi-site site. It has two separate databases. And once the site was cloned and moved over to another server, I went through it and I injected common security mistakes that people make. And then I handed it over to our two hackers, and I didn't tell them what they were. So just as if I had put up a site and actually made these mistakes, they had to discover them and try to figure out what to do on their own. Here's the you know, warning, don't try this at home. Um, the actions taken here would be illegal. Uh, you could go to jail for doing this. So we like all of you, don't end up in jail. <laughs> And then in a little side note here, if we were to actually watch a hacker hack against a complex target, it's not something you do in an hour. It's something that might take hours, weeks, maybe even years. If there's social engineering involved, if there's a lot of probing involved, it's not something that happens quickly. So for our first little subset here, we have a hacker, and they're going to look around the site. And so I think that's working. Yeah. There we go. Yes. So. Ben. Sure. So this, in this case, the hacker is looking for weaknesses in the site, sort of probing things about the Drupal site that might be exploitable. So risks that exist in all Drupal sites, or maybe in particular this one, if it's using custom modules or custom things. So one of the first things was looking to see if the site has full HTML available or PHP filter available to anonymous users. So filter tips is a place uh, you can visit on all Drupal sites. It shows you what input formats are available for anonymous users. And then the attacker go is looking around for you know, other things. Maybe there's some place where content can be injected, comments or uh, nodes or any other forms that are accessible to the anonymous user. And, and it's interesting, I think, when looking around at the site, uh, you may notice that it's giving a couple of different kinds of errors. So some of them are page not found that are being de developed by, or uh, that are being produced by Drupal. Some of them are um, access denied being generated by Apache, it looks like. Um, and then also page not found being generated by Apache. And those different errors happen for um, different kinds of uh, files. Yeah. And so you can see, in this case, like the attacker found um, something called the add this module. Add this is a social widgets uh, sort of plug in, went to Drupal.org to read about that module and discover if maybe that module has a public security issue. Maybe the site is running an out of date version of that module. So, you know, sort of probing for weaknesses, either very uh, low hanging fruit in a sense, weaknesses that can just be publicly exploited or easily exploited. Uh, and sort of this is referred to as fingerprinting or um, sort of doing analysis on the site to sort of understand what those weaknesses are. And so in this case, um, how do you fingerprint like a particular version of a Drupal module? Well, you look for public artifacts of that module, like a CSS file or a JavaScript file that might, you might be able to then use to distinguish what particular version. So um, you know, Drupal.org is the source of this module. So you can get identifiers like the MD5 hash of, that, of a CSS or JS file. And then you can get that for what's running on the site. And you can compare them to sort of try to identify uh, which particular version of the module. This is used by the Blind Elephant tool. It's a, it's a general open source tool for fingerprinting, um, all, lots of different types of web applications. In this case, um, you know, the attacker is doing it uh, manually just by doing MD5 hashes of, of these files. <laughs> Like this is, in my mind, some of the good news is that uh, Ben's not super efficient at this because he doesn't attack sites all the time, right? <laughs> like, if you were attacking sites all the time, then uh, he would probably have more automation. Yeah. So once the attacker's done some anonymous fingerprinting, the attacker attempts to create an account to see what they're capable of doing. So along with fingerprinting, like for particular vulnerabilities, you know, you want to try to um, an attacker will want to try to get access, you know, elevation, uh, elevated access, you know, administrator access if they can, or, or anything beyond an, an anonymous user, you know, assuming that there's not a vulnerability immediately exploitable as an anonymous user. Um, so it just so happens on this Drupal site, was able to register for an account. So the Drupal site allowed me to create an account on the site. So, okay, well, now that I have an account, what can I do? And I 
in, I think where it's at now, it's it's before having created an account. So still sort you're of great. You know you're logged right? in. Oh. So logged in, looking at what can happen as an uh, authenticated user. So again, checking input formats or text formats um, for if anything beyond filtered HTML is available, specifically looking for like if JavaScript or PHP can be executed. And so we see our hacker create a comment and inject some uh, set the format to full HTML and sex of, uh, in, inject some evil JavaScript, but it doesn't work. <laughs> and it doesn't work because the hacker actually made a mistake. They're posting their evil JavaScript into a WYSIWYG editor that's actually converting it to uh, es basically escaping it. So our hacker is going to like confirm, yes, full HTML is available on here. And oh, they just figured out that they can dis, wait, no, click it. <laughs> or not. <laughs> and so the JavaScript being injected here is an attempt to steal uh, access from somebody who has elevated or administrative access on the site. So it's a, it's a cookie theft attack. Basically, the JavaScript, when if executed by somebody with uh, elevated permissions on the site, will steal their um, cookie, which you can then fake and get authenticated access on the site as that person. How many people have seen like a security demo and like it ends with the person who's demoing it like get really happy that they made hello world or hello pop up in a JavaScript dialogue? So that's basically the way to test to see if JavaScript gets executed. And if it does, you can do all sorts of fun things like steal a cookie. What else can you do? <laughs> uh, yeah. anything, anything that you can do in your browser, cross-site scripting can do on your behalf. So if you're logged in as an admin and you can enable or disable a module, disable the two-factor authentication module, JavaScript in your browser can do that for you. I, I actually had a question on this one. Sure. Um, I thought that the cookies were HTTP only. So does this attack work on that? Um. I don't know. Did you test that? Did you actually try stealing a cookie? No. Okay. Well. But but a, I think an attacker, like attacking the site, you know, would you yeah, know maybe yeah, yeah. would have discovered that if the particular thing about the cookies were mitigating against it. So it's it, that test. that's mitigated in Drupal seven and eight, I guess, um, but not so much in Drupal six. Yeah. yeah. Which Drupal six is now end of life. So if you're <laughs> running a Drupal six mod uh, site, you should update it or find a long term support vendor to help you out. So our hacker is going to find a huge misconfiguration. And as I said earlier, I injected some common mistakes into the site. And I actually didn't mean to inject this. I did it by mistake. But what you can see is it's pretty, pretty bad. Our hacker is actually able to edit their own user account and elevate their permissions to administrator. <laughs> now, I honestly did not mean to do this. But what's interesting to me is not that the hacker was able to do that, because there's other ways to do that. It's what the hacker does after they get that. So whether or not they clicked a checkbox and gave themselves admin, or they stole a cookie and then logged in as the admin, or they password sniffed the admin account, what do they do next? They've got admin on your site. What are they going to do? And so it looks like our attacker has enabled the Devel module and is now writing PHP code. Wait. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm and so they're writing some PHP code, and they're looking at settings.php. So they've got the entire contents of settings.php on the browser. That includes your database credential strings. So what are they going to do now? But of course there's a file world protecting the database, right? No, of course <laughs> not. <laughs> so they've now dumped settings.php to a text file so they can download it to their local machine and read it. And they're calling it files, CSS, CSS. That's the name of the file. So if you were looking at your file system, you wouldn't even know it didn't belong necessarily. Well, CSS is a strange file name. But. So now they've got a copy of settings.php, and they're going through and trying to find something interesting from it. And you can see they're just writing PHP here. So this is referred to as code execution or, or code injection. It's um, injecting malicious PHP code into the application. And it's made available by the dev module. So make sure your permissions for the dev module are configured correctly. Or better yet, don't run dev on a live site. <laughs> Just remove it from the code base when you push it to the production server. I also really appreciate that the hacker, uh, in this case, cleaned up after themselves, right? They're very, very tidy, um, <laughs> which, is, which is always nice when you have a guest. Um, but it, <laughs> 
But it's interesting how, like, um, you know, you, you have to think about what is the motivation of the attacker. If the motivation of the attacker is to control the site for a long time, then they are going to want to clean up, clean up after themselves so it's hard to find them. And, and uh, when the attacker created their account, they didn't just say, well, I'm an evil attacker is my username. It was admin1, right? Which probably a lot of sites have an account called admin1, or at least it wouldn't be noticed. So they've now finding the username and password for the database out of settings.php, and they're just running the MySQL dump command to dump a copy of the database. <laughs> in, an, in an effort to still also hide, the tr hide their tracks, they're dumping the file as, you know, not .sql, but as .css, and trying to hide it in the Drupal's files directory. And they were able to do that, and they're now downloading the several, the very large database, but it's too large for them to download. <laughs> Like, it, it's, it's probably 100 megs, and that's taking too long. So now they're gzipping the database. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, like, this is taking a little bit to run because it's got to gzip the database. Oh, much faster. Look at that go. <laughs> so it went from 13 minutes to half of that, or to a minute, basically. And so now they can just suck down the entire database. And, of course, when they're done, they're going to remove the database because they don't want the administrator to come back and find it later. And so there's the database. They see it. They're going to rename it to something that makes sense. And now they're going to read through the database. They've got the whole database there. And now they're going to delete the database. Deleting the database copy on the On the site. server, yes. Mm -hmm. Not deleting the actual database, because that would break the thing. And now you can see that they've actually removed the database. So. You know, while they elevated themselves through a bug that I really didn't mean to introduce, they, um, they got themselves the database pretty easily once they had access to run PHP code. And so that's, that's kind of scary. So we've got another misconfiguration here. So in, in another way of probing is, you know, checking for static files, um, you know, fingerprinting the site, you might check the um, changelog.txt to see which version Drupal is. Um, in this case, they found a readme.txt that happened to have a plain text password for an admin account. So one of the issues with like GitHub and Bitbucket is they prompt you to create a readme file. Drupal doesn't have one by default, and it prompts you to create one. And so this person created one with the SQL credentials to the database in it that happened to work. So now we can see that our hacker found this readme file and is now actually going through the database for another site. And what they do is actually going to be interesting. Also, this was actually, I take that back. This is not the database credentials. This is the login for admin to the actual site itself. So the database server was configured to listen on a port improperly. And so they were able to connect to it as anonymous and have read access. They can't write, so they can't change anything. But you can see that our user, or our hacker, not our user, is actually running the TFA module, so their database has two-factor in it. So even with the admin and testing 123 password, they couldn't actually log in. But with database access, they're going to do something else. And so we actually see our hacker writing code here. Yeah, we, we moved through this kind of fast, but the, the attacker having UID 1 access, were, they were blocked by the TFA module. Two-factor authentication, it's an additional t uh, item that you need to log into a site. Um, so in this case, having both the UID1 password as well as the database dump, the attacker is going to sort of reverse engineer that two-factor authentication security control and get access. So with the, with the database comes um, the Drupal private key, if the Drupal private key is stored there. And the Drupal private key is used for generation, generating tokens and other security hash, uh, secure hashes um, on the site. So the TFA module, um, by default, you know, will rely on that token if it's not configured otherwise. And so, um, but by being able to have a read access to the database, we can get um, something for that particular UID1 user. Uh, we can get the hashed um, data for that second token. And now, the, now having that, we just need to use the private key to like recreate the, uh, what's referred to as the seed for that token. And a lot of that's very specific to the TFA module. So uh, basically, we're, we're just seeing, a, um, seeing somebody get access by reverse engineering uh, a security control. And so 
Well, I was just going to say another, um, you know, this is a good reason to sanitize database backups. Um, you know, if, if, if some of your information, like the Drupal private key, gets into your, uh, into your database, and then you have a backup copy of your database on your laptop, and you leave your laptop in the bin at TSA, um, now whoever picks it up has access to that information that can be used to attack your site. Um, so, you know, before you put your database outside of the production environment, it's good to clean out all of that secret information. And I think there's a nice tool to do that <laughs> by default, isn't there, Greg? There, there are many nice tools for doing that. Um, Drush SQL Sanitize is a good tool that most people have installed because it's just available with Drush. Um, but yeah, within the Paranoia module, there's a tool called SQL Sanitize Whitelist, uh, which is much more aggressive and thorough about how it cleans out tables. And so what we're going to see is, oh, here's our two-factor authentication, and we basically use the script, and we're now logged in as admin. <laughs> so, what, what, what we did here is we basically set up several sites for the purpose of being hacked. And, you know, when I was doing these, I was kind of going through my mind, okay, how should I set this up in a manner that can be attacked? And is it going to take, you know, my hackers, you know, multiple hours to do this? Because, you know, I knew they were to rush and, I, you know, they know the common configuration mistakes. And I obviously made a mistake in there, but what was interesting to me is they didn't approach it the way I thought they'd approach it. So this was somewhat of a learning thing in that, you know, and it's a learning thing for everybody out there because when your sites get hacked, not if, when your sites get hacked, you know, how the attacker can elevate their privileges is actually the more important question. It's not if they get hacked, it's when, and what can they do when they do. So dumping my database, getting access to those keys, that's all really bad. So you know, let's, let's kind of think about that. You're at risk. Your sites are at risk. So, you know, this model that, you know, I've, I've checked my checkbox off on security, I ran my Nmap, you know, I'm good. I got TFA installed, I'm done with security, I'm not gonna get hacked, that's a myth. Your, your sites are at risk, so the question becomes, how do you defend yourself? And since everyone is at risk, the, really, the real question becomes, what do you do to reduce that risk? So, you're at risk, you have a risk, you know, in the same way that you you know, could be at risk for having a heart attack, what do you do to reduce that risk? Well, you don't exercise one time a year. You exercise daily, maybe weekly. You eat good food. You don't eat fry food, fried food unless you're in New Orleans. <laughs> so you, you follow these daily best practices. And just like you know, with your risk for a heart attack, Drupal has best practices. One of those is to follow the Drupal security team. If you're on the Drupal security team, please stand up. <laughs> How many people in here? Three? Uh -huh. So, and I guess the three of us should be standing up. But So please don't ask any of these people in this room to remove their shirt. You might see like a portal to the internet. <laughs> um, we follow, the security team follows responsible disclosure to help keep your site secure. And kind of that process is basically we, we take incoming reports about security vulnerabilities, we verify that they're accurate, we then work with the maintainers to get those issues fixed, and then we release security advisories and whatever the updated version of the uh, code is on a Wednesday in a coordinated release fashion. And we provide advice on best practices for maintainers if they have a question about how to handle something. Anything you want to add? The security team doesn't actively scan all Drupal modules, uh, so there's no sort of active process in that regard. It's more of a reactive of if a security vulnerability is found. There are members of the team on their own time who do um, some of that analysis, but it's not, a, it's not an active um, process. And as I said, we release updates on Wednesdays, typically between noon and 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, kind of trending more towards like noon 30, 1 o'clock, somewhere in that range, but sometimes it gets spread out. Uh, so what does that mean on Wednesdays? You, you should have a, a little bit of time set aside to see if there's any release announcements. You can follow us on Twitter. We have RSS feeds. We send out emails, which you can subscribe to if you have a Drupal.org account. Edit your profile. I, it's moved around a bunch of times, but I think there's something called my newsletters. 
and there's a box in there to check to see if you can subscribe. Having said that, we just updated our list infrastructure, and I don't think we checked that today, and I'm looking at Rudy to, to actually see if that, I don't think we did that. So if it doesn't work, we'll have it fixed soon. <laughs> Uh, but do set a time, the, the time on Wednesdays. It's important to do. It's the number one easiest thing you can do to keep your site secure, is just keep it updated. And that doesn't just go for your site, that goes for everything you're running in your stack. So whether it's Drupal or Linux or MySQL or your firewall, there was a Cisco ASA firewall issue that came out about three months ago where someone could get root on your firewall. So keep all your components in your stack up to date. It's the easiest defense you can have against hackers. It doesn't require much extra work. It's really simple to do. And I think one thing that goes along with that is that not only should you set aside time, but you should also make it as easy as, of a process as possible and make it uh, easy to recover if there's a problem. So you know, um, you want to make the deployment as automated as possible, make the integration of new code as automated as possible, have automated tests if you can, have a QA process that you're confident in, you know, just make that as easy as possible so then as you're looking at these new releases and you say, wow, that's a lot, instead so you're saying, oh, no problem, I'll just push the button and it'll happen, hopefully. How many people have an automated deployment workflow? Okay. How many people have backups? How many people have ever destroyed their production environment and recreated it from backup in a testing environment? So for everybody whose hands were up earlier who said they had backups, your backups are useless if they don't work. <laughs> so it's not enough just to back up the things. Actually try restoring as if your production environment got destroyed. Uh, we run a drill typically where we take those backups, throw them on a drive, and restore them to a different provider. So we test to make sure that if, you know, provider A went belly up and is gone and all the data they had is gone, could we get up and running and how long does that take? And then from a business side, is that okay with the business, you know, folks? Is a 20 hour restore time acceptable? And if not, what do we do to speed that up? You know, I said keep your stack up to date. You know, I want to also bring up, you guys all have laptops you use to connect to your sites. Make sure your laptops are up to date. Uh, the CVE 2016-2315 uh, is a Git vulnerability in which if you check out a repository with malicious code in it, it runs shell, shell scripts on your local machine as you. So it could take your SSH keys and send them to a third party. I've got a repo for people to check out after this. Um, <laughs> But the point is, is that every component you're using in your stack, including your local machine, potentially is vulnerable. Uh, the image magic one is a great one. It's not Drupal specific, but if you're running image magic, you need to mitigate that. Uh, and there's directions online how to do so. If you're running with a hosting provider, well, we'll talk about that in a second. So that kind of goes to process. How many people have like checked off the security checkbox before? <laughs> Nobody's willing to admit this? So like you'll see, I won't name names, you know, these proposals that come from Drupal vendors where they actually have a line item for security and it's a checkbox, it's a sprint basically, where they're gonna go through and secure the site normally after it's built. <laughs> that doesn't really work. <laughs> security should be embedded into every sprint. When you're, at, when you're installing a module, you should sit there and ask yourself, hey, what is the impact for me installing this module on the security of my site? And you should be also be asking, what's the performance impact? Not that that's related to security, but when you're making decisions regarding your site, there's all these different questions that come into mind. Okay. <laughs> you know, this is, I, I put this up because I made this mistake. Drupal has a lot of these check boxes in it and these drop down things and they're really cool UI widgets because we don't have to write code to do things, but you have to be aware of the check box. I accidentally clicked administer permissions. Oops. I've seen other sites where people have checked other things like use administration system. And you, uh, what's the other one? Um, administer taxonomy. Well, administer taxonomy is not a security issue. People need to be able to add and remove taxonomy. But administering taxonomy lets you administer fields, which kind of makes it a security issue. Uh, your users are probably your biggest security issue. Sorry about that, but they're probably your like single point of weakness, unfortunately. Audit your configuration. Never give anyone you don't 100% trust full HTML. 
Uh, side story on this, you know, you've got content editors who work on your site, they're trusted, they're employees, you give them full HTML. I've seen people copy and paste JavaScript code off the internet into a site because they were trying to accomplish something. That's bad, especially because <laughs> they don't understand the code they're copying. Um, and anything that has admin star, has the little italicized text under it, you know, give this to trusted users only. Really, trusted users is almost a synonym for site builders and administrators. Like, I know we all can't follow that all the time, but we should try to. And I would say these are, this list is the root of a lot of the vulnerabilities shown in those videos because the MySQL database had read access available to anonymous people. You could, like, connect to it from anywhere on the internet. That's a configuration issue. Um, the Drupal site had, uh, was allowed to just, like, grant administrative role to that um, after creating an account. That's also a configuration issue. So it's sort of these things pile up. You know, getting a little bit of access, you find some more access and the like. So there's a, there's a term of defense in, defense in depth about like, you know, auditing configuration, but also putting in security controls behind that and sort of thinking holistically about this and not just a checkbox, as Michael said. Most attacks aren't the result of one vulnerability. SAO5 was kind of the exception there, but most attacks are I use a little, one little vulnerability, which then I use another vulnerability, and now I've got root everywhere. Um, so keep that in mind. Also, there are modules out there whose sole purpose is to increase your security. Like that's all they're designed to do, is to increase your security. This is not an exhaustive list, but we'll go through these. Two-factor authentication, really easy to run on your site. It's really, really easy to run on your site. It doesn't require anything special. Just install it, set it up. It provides an enormous second layer of authentication or second layer of security for your users. It's sometimes a pain to use, but the security out, you know, security's never easy. The, the security protections you get, the risk you mitigate by using it is worth it. And despite the video, you, unless you have a configuration issue that gives people access to their private key, you can't just like hack TFA module that way. Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to hack. Actually, we, we ran a bounty on it where we basically threw it up on a hosting provider and gave out the username and password. I think it was admin admin and said, if you can get access to this site and create a node on the site or modify a node, we will give you money and ran that for three months, I think. Yeah, it, like was, it was $500, so like not, not, not an extreme amount, amount, but also not a trivial amount of money. Um, and there were, uh, I think we counted something like 40 different IP addresses who tried to attack it. Um, a couple of people tried brute force attacks on it, which is like a theoretical possibility with a six-digit number. Um, but you know, even after hitting the mathematical number where they should have been able to break it, that person was still not able to break it. Um, so you know, we we had said the brute force attacks were out of scope because you know one of the things that um, I think is important with security is that you know you know that you're going to get attacked. So as somebody uh, is is attacking you, want you want that to be noisy, if especially if they've like moved from one place to another. Um, so you want to have detection in place that will make it noisy for them to do that. And a brute force attack on a TOTP code is going to be a pretty noisy thing because it's going to take uh, you know hundreds of thousands of visits to your site from one IP. <laughs> Uh, and actually, TFA now no longer allows brute force attacks. Oh, that's right. Using flood, it has flood protection. That's right. So it's, uh, it's harder. It's You'd harder. have to take a lot longer. Yeah, it'd take a lot. Yeah. It'd take a lot longer. So paranoia is a really cool module. It mitigates an enormous number, amount of risk. It is the type of thing that you probably want to start on a dev site or a staging site. I would not roll it out to your production site. It does make things. It, it takes the best practices that you should be following and makes you follow them. For lack of a Basically, it's the best way to describe it. So if you're using PHP code anywhere on your site and you install Paranoia, you're not using PHP code anywhere on your site anymore. <laughs> um, so that's the type of thing you want to install. A password policy module. There's a lot of these, but basically, if people are using a password of one character, that's bad. This stops that. <laughs> Security review is a module that basically goes through your configuration and sees if you're doing some known common mistakes. So all it does is generate a report. It doesn't change anything, but it's the type of thing you can automate. So there's a Drush script for it, and you can run it on your site with every deployment and see if people are, you know, have done things that they shouldn't be doing. And Account Sentinel. Yeah, um, Account Sentinel is a relatively new module. Um, it, it basically takes a look at the accounts on your site 
Um, so it, it helps to protect against the instance that we saw earlier of an, an attacker creating an account called admin1 and then granting it the admin role. Account Sentinel knows everybody who is an admin and it stores that fact in a database table with a hash. Um, the hash is hopefully stored in the settings p or based on a, um, a uh, salt that's stored in the settings.php so that the hash can't be tampered in the database directly. Um, so Account Sentinel really, really knows if there are any new accounts added to your site with different roles, different permissions on them, a couple different things like that. And it will send you an email whenever that happens. Uh, it sends an email whenever um, a password is changed. If you're using the password strength module, it will also tell you how strong that person's uh, password was. Um, has a, a handful of other features like that so that you can understand, you know, gives you, makes that um, attack noisy, right? As I was saying earlier, it helps you to know if, if you've got an attack going on. So hosting. Basically, pay for good hosting. Don't use $10 shared hosting or $50 shared hosting on the $100,000 sites you just bought. <laughs> Shared hosting isn't secure, it's cheap. If you're gonna spend the money to build a good site, don't host it on the cheap. I should say don't, don't spend money then, oh yeah, I worded it correctly. So host your sites on, I'm not naming company names, but you know, if you spend, spend the appropriate money for where your site lives, it is your site's home. Don't put your site in with a bunch of other sites, it won't be happy for all sorts of reasons. Um, HTTPS, so we have this wonderful new project out called Let's Encrypt. It generates free SSL certs. There is never a reason to host a site that isn't under SSL. If you're not serving your site over SSL, do it now. And there's a module out there that lets you like log in over SSL and then like transfers you back to a non-secure domain, don't use that. It, it exposes cookies and all sorts of other things. Uh, there's no server cost to running SSL nowadays. Just, just host your site under SSL. Every major hosting company allows this, and if your hosting company doesn't, find a different one. And then, you know, getting close to the end here because I want to take questions, repeat this on your own sites. So pretend to be a hacker and find out what you can explore on your own sites or have slash pay someone else to do it for you. Um, it's really illuminating what you discover when you go through this on your own site. Um, I will be posting more videos online. There were more videos. We cut the videos down. Also, the videos were sped up significantly so that we weren't sitting here for an hour and a half watching videos. Uh, I will put the videos online probably at the end of the day tomorrow, depending on how fast the campus or the Wi-Fi connection is. Uh, may take a few days. Um, and so we'll, we'll get the videos online. You'll be able to watch them all. There's ones that are narrated so you kind of see what's going on in real time. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and let's take some questions. Yeah, come on up to the mic, please. Um, I kind of missed the beginning of your talk, so forgive me if you already went over this, but in recent days, we've gone through dozens, dozens of hacked sites. It happens more and more freaking all the time. And for the most part, people don't have backups, or at least they don't have a backup procedure that yields them with a backup that's not also hacked. So what are your methods of going into a site and going through its files and looking for that information so, without backups? Sorry. So. You know, I, I typically, you know, there's the hardline approach that says that once a site's been hacked, there is no 100% surefire way to make sure that it's secure again. Um, you know, the presentation that I think we did last year basically tells the story of someone who got hacked, they put, they clean it up, they put their site back online, and it continually gets hacked again because they didn't find anything. There is the hacked module, which basically goes through and tries to find what's been done. Uh, a lot of manual review of user accounts. There's, there is a, um, a page in the handbook, oh, that's, uh, yeah. triple.org node 2365547. I've, I've read it. I'm right. Oh, you read it. Okay. Well, I've done a lot of the things yeah. you're saying, and I was curious if they mirrored something you would do beside actually just rebuilding the whole site, which typically is not in their budget. You know, you got to go, a lot of it's just manual, right? And yeah. It, it's, it's manual and it's never guaranteed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So my question is about the modules, like new modules. Um, how long does it take before you guys bless them to say it's okay that they're able to be used um, for the rest of us using modules on, on Drupal sites? 
So that's a good question. Uh, actually, at the moment, the maintainers make that decision. Uh, we have a proposal that we'll be looking at that may change the way that works, but for now, the maintainers basically say this is a stable module, and as soon as they do that, it gets security team coverage, and if it's reported as a vulnerability, we follow our processes. Um, and that's why we have the sandbox and the project applications to help make sure that people aren't just throwing up code on the internet. Thank you. And just to expand on that, the, as a security team to say this module is okay to you know, be run, that's a sort of hard thing to say for everybody who's building Drupal modules and running Drupal sites. So the way that the security team has decided to communicate that is to say security advisories, which is a you know, vulnerability report and an upgrade path, that's gonna come out for stable modules only. Uh, so dev modules or alpha beta modules. Right now, those don't, go, don't get security advisors, and that's just the way to communicate from the team. Um, but obviously that's an uh, impediment for some like module development process, so that's the proposal that uh, Michael's elaborating on. I'd say, you know, in, in my experience, um, like basically every site that I've seen that was exploited, they were exploited with vulnerabilities, you know, unless you're, unless you're like uh, Stuxnet or something like that. Like very few um, uh, resources are compromised by something that's a true zero day that has not been disclosed yet. And so having a healthy, functioning, uh, coordinated disclosure program is the best thing that a software project can do to ensure the safety of their users and that, uh, of the site builders, and it's the responsibility of the site builders then to upgrade quickly. Um, so I would say, you know, favor modules that have a stable, you know, 1.0 release uh, when you can, and if you can't, encourage the maintainer to do that, work with them to get that done, uh, maybe pay them to get that done, and then follow updates as quickly as possible. Those are you know, really the two keys in my mind to have a safe site. All right, can you discuss a little bit about sort of a drive-by or automated scans or attacks, where it's not so tailored or individual, but it's just they're out there kind of sucking up the data. If you could discuss some simple mitigation me measures. I, we can all take that, yes. Sure. Um, so you, if you look at your access log, or whatever your web server happens to call it, you will see these. And what, what normally is happening is there's been a publicly disclosed vulnerability in a project, and a attacker is basically scanning the internet, trying to find servers that are running that particular version of that project, or just running that project. So you know this happens in everything, WordPress, Drupal, PHP, my admin had one for ages. <laughs> And you know, you'll see attackers going through and just seeing, you know, does this path exist? Does this path exist? Does this path exist? Does this path exist? Excuse me. And so when they find it, they know they can attempt to exploit that vulnerability. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one good solution to that, there's a lot of uh, cloud web application firewall providers, or there are some web application firewalls you can install yourself and run yourself that have sort of default rule sets to block that kind of traffic, and that's helpful um, to reduce the resources that are wasted on those requests. It's, it's helpful to get that noise out of your logs so that log analysis and log review will be more valuable. Um, so that seems like a good solution. Um, I, I mostly just ignore it, honestly, um, which is probably not the best <laughs> solution. So you heard it here, card.com yeah. ignores. Uh, <laughs> I mean, on my personal site. Oh, your um, personal site, okay. So fail to ban is a really cool tool used for SSH. So if you're attempting to brute force an SSH password, then it basically gives you like five tries by default and then blocks your IP for a certain amount of time. I've seen people who run just Drupal sites configure that if someone goes to like WP admin on a Drupal site, just block the IP. They're up to no good. Like WP admin is not a URL that exists on a Drupal site unless you've done something very strange. <laughs> Uh, then, you know, so you can install fail to ban or other modules that basically say, oh, you're trying to access this URL that you shouldn't go to, block. Uh, you gotta be a little careful with that because not everyone has a dedicated IP address, so, yeah. I'll, you know, you may be blocking a good portion of users. Uh, Drupal.org tried doing this for a while and ended up blocking, I think, a small country. <laughs> Am I right on that? I think there was some, like, we, I'm sorry? Oh, okay, it's not a small country. <laughs> so we blocked a large chunk of users by, you know, because one user was behaving as a bad actor. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I have a site that we're migrating to Drupal over the next 12 months, but uh, we have more users over the age of 90 than we do under the age of 40. And so I have stakeholders who are very loath to put forth any sort of strong password policy or two-factor authentication. Uh, is there anything I can do other than uh, cross my arms on the CEO's desk to, uh, to harden my site despite those sorts of limitations? Do they have to have user accounts? Uh, they do, yes. Do they need privileges on those user accounts, like full HTML? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> so, that, I mean, that's, that's a huge mitigation there, is that, you know, just because a user, I mean, take Drupal.org, for example. Everyone in this room can log into Drupal.org. We don't enforce strong passwords on Drupal.org. So, now, what we do do is if you have admin rights on Drupal.org, you must go through TFA. But anyone can log into Drupal.org, and, you know, we also do a... Uh, it's been called many things over the years, but we put you in a penalty box, or a penalty box is the wrong term, but we put you in a little waiting period to make sure you're not a spammer before we give you privileges to create anything anywhere. On-ramp. On-ramp, there we go. It's the welcoming process. I, I, penalty box, I, I call it penalty box because I'm thinking of PostGray, which was a mail server implementation of the same concept. I, I think one other thing you can do is um, analysis of the machines that they're coming from. You can do like browser fingerprinting. I mean, if, I guess it sort of depends upon the accounts. Like if they, if they don't have administrator rights, if they're, not, if they're not accessing sensitive information about themselves or other people, then you know, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe they can have a bad password and that's okay. You can just accept that um, as a risk for some levels of accounts. But, but there are other tools that you can use to um, fingerprint the browser, looking at the user agent, the language. Um, looking at how quickly the people type, looking at the IP address that they come from, the IP address or the um, the geolocation, like HTML5 geolocation that they're coming from. Like, there's a lot of things like that that you can use to create a fingerprint of visitors to your site. And if you see all of a sudden that they're logging in from somewhere faster than you know uh, jet travel would allow, then you can like you know look into the account and see is this okay or not. If anybody Thank wants you. to build that module. <laughs> yeah. So just a reminder, please join us for our hacking sprints. Yes, I modified the default slide. And we've got some people we want to thank, uh, as well as take the survey evaluating this session. We did things a little differently, as you might be able to notice. So we'd like to get some feedback from you on what you thought of it. We have the node ID on the, on the slide, which we got by viewing the source code on the page. <laughs> Are there any other questions? If you're logged in with edit privileges, sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.